Good afternoon. And welcome to this very special Council of American Ambassadors Roundtable with Senator Bill Haggerty. I'm Kathleen Sheehan. I'm the Executive Director at the Council. And just two brief housekeeping notes before we get going. First, that we're going to be recording today's talk so that members of the Council who can't join it live can watch it later. And second, we strongly encourage questions for the audience. And to submit a question, all you have to do is click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then write in your question and then our moderator Moderator will uh, read those questions to our guest um, when the time comes. And so with that, I'm very honored to turn the floor over to council member and ambassador Todd Sedgwick, who's going to introduce the senator. Todd Sedgwick. Senator, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, senator, we're so grateful for, uh, to you for taking your valuable time out from your schedule in the Senate to, to join us. You have a lot of your colleagues on the line here. Um, I believe you're the only sitting senator who has served as ambassador. Uh, to our for our country, that's correct. Um, and uh, the uh, we normally have our meetings in the Anderson Room in the Metropolitan Club. And Lars Anderson himself was a an ambassador to Japan er, uh, early in the turn of the last century. And then you have many uh, illustrious uh, predecessors, including Douglas MacArthur II, Mike Mansfield, Walter Mondale, Tom Foley, your fellow Tennessean Howard Baker. Sure and uh, Caroline Kennedy. So you, you follow along a distinguished uh, uh, group of uh, ambassadors and uh, you did a great job over there. You were well qualified to go to Japan because uh, early in your career, you spent three years there with the Boston Consulting Group, uh, served as an economic advisor and White House fellow under George H.W. Bush, went into the private equity business as a co-founder of your own, your own firm, Haggerty Peterson and Company, and uh, also you served as uh, commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Economic and Community Development. And uh, I think one of your great achievements was to bring uh, Major League Soccer to, uh, to Nashville. Um, but uh, we're so grateful for you to join us. And I want to encourage the uh, audience to ask you questions, not only about your tenure in uh, Tokyo, but also you're serving on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So if there are any issues there that you want to talk about in your talk or that they, the folks want to ask questions of, uh, feel free. So, Senator, we're so grateful, and I'll turn it over. The floor is yours. Really appreciate your coming. Well, Todd, it's wonderful to be back with you again. You know, you and I have done this before. It's it's always been a, a wonderful exchange, and I'm honored to be here with you and with, with so many of, of our colleagues. And and I, I must say, I, I you know got a, got a new role. Uh, right now in the United States Senate, but I thought it would be uh, it would be helpful to re reflect on my past role as ambassador and how I think it uniquely prepared me to uh, to, to serve in this new role as United States Senator. Um, many of you will remember the experience of having presidential visits. Uh, I had three of them during my term, uh, including one state visit, uh, vice presidential trips, I think the same number. Um, I had the great privilege to attend the G20. It was held in Osaka and uh, actually sit in the president's place during one of the four rounds um, of that meeting. What an experience. I attended the UN General Assembly a couple of times uh, when I was serving as ambassador. Uh, one of the observations I, I, I'm sure everyone on the, on the call will appreciate, but I think it's, it, it's gonna be extremely helpful to me here, uh, is the fact that you're running a microcosm of the United States government when you serve as ambassador. I uh, had more than 20 departments and agencies represented other than the State Department uh, in, in my embassy. And I, I'm certain everybody on this, uh, this call has had a similar experience. But it, it was always helpful to be able to get different departments and agencies in the same room. Uh, ambassador Tom Schieffer uh, had the foresight to bring learning from his ambassadorship in Australia uh, to Japan when he served as ambassador there. And he began a, a process which I continued of having all the intelligence agencies meet together, get them around the same table. Uh, and we did that once a week. It was helpful for me to hear what they were all doing. It was helpful for them to hear my schedule because sometimes they wanted to participate in meetings I was conducting, et cetera. But even more so, it was helpful for them to hear what each other were doing. And, and you know, in Washington, I think things get so stovepiped. Uh, when you're out serving you know, in an embassy, in a mission, uh, you have a real opportunity to bring cross-functional teams together and really get the, the, the full weight of the U.S. government behind something. So I, I felt that was uh, an important insight and, and, and 
opportunity uh, that, that I hope will help me um, you know, serve effectively here. And not only am I on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, but I'm on the Appropriations Committee, uh, which has broad oversight over, over the appropriation of authorized funds. I'm also on the Senate Banking Committee, which probably has the largest jurisdiction of any committee uh, in the United States Senate. And having had that experience, again, of, of running this, you know, this, this smaller microcosm of the United States government, I think is going to inform my, my service and my effectiveness, I hope, uh, as, I, as I move forward in this job. Um, if, if I also think about some of the things that were quite helpful uh, for me in, in my role, we had a standing breakfast every month with the five eyes. Uh, that means I met with the ambassadors from Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the UK. Uh, we use that as an opportunity to share information. And uh, you know, I think that sort of collaboration, very, very helpful. When I was out uh, in Japan, we really ramped up uh, our focus on the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, Ambassador Cole House, I, I think, may be on the call. Uh, Ambassador Harris, uh, I, I think, may be on the call. Uh, the, the, think about the strategic positioning of uh, our ambassadors. Ken Jester was, was in India. Uh, Ken, Harry, and I were able to get together with Ambassador Branstad and really send a strong message. Uh, about cooperation and, and support for the Indo-Pacific strategy. And we need to continue to foster and support that. I'm in a unique position here now to, to, to speak to that and to continue to support it. The Biden administration has continued to, uh, to support our posture and strengthen it. So I think all of, all of that is, is very, very helpful. Um, the job in Japan is a little bit unique in terms of the military presence that we have there. But I know that many of the ambassadors on this call uh, had that same experience. The, the, the best part of my experience was working with the men and women of our U.S. military. U.S. Forces Japan, based there in, 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 in Japan, has more active duty military serving there than any other nation where we have military installations. And so I worked on a very regular basis with Harry Harris when he was uh, you know, head of the Pacific Command, later, later to be named the Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, and with Phil Davidson, who uh, is, 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 I think, coming, his term is coming to an end right now, but, but very close working relationship with the Indo-Pacific Command, actually a close relationship with U.S. Forces Korea before Harry Harris got there, I worked closely with Vince Brooks, and of course, uh, with our military based in Japan. Everybody here knows their history, but um, after MacArthur uh, came and actually lived in the house that I was privileged to live in, he moved into that house in September of 1945, uh, but MacArthur rewrote the Japanese constitution at that point. Japan does not have an offensive military capability, and we have a, an important role to protect and defend Japan. But also, if you think about what's happening in that region, you've got North Korea, Russia, and China right there. And I hope we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about what that presents. Todd, you and I have spent time talking about that. But a great part of my experience dealing with the United States military and with our intelligence organizations, again, I think it is gonna help inform me greatly in my current position, and I couldn't be more I guess I'll just say this, I couldn't be more honored to have had the, the chance to represent America. It would have been an honor to any country. I particularly was an honor to do it in Japan because it's a country where I lived before, as Todd said, and I have a great affinity for, for the, the nation, its culture, its people. So, you know, the, the highest honor I think that, uh, that, that I could ever hope for was the opportunity to rep represent our nation in that way. And I'm now pleased to represent my home state in a different role. Um, but, but happy to entertain questions in, in any direction that we want to go from here, Todd. I'll kick it back to you. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, uh, for your talk, and really appreciate your uh, talk, particularly some of the things you, uh, the way you convene people around the issues are, are really, is really very instructive. I know we have a lot of pent up uh, demand for questions, so um, I got a question from. Uh, Jim Blanchard, who was governor of Michigan and our ambassador to Canada, he said that when he was in Michigan as governor in the 80s, he led the country in new Japanese manufacturing investment. He was very proud of it and spent a lot of time on that. I, I assume that you got involved in the reverse investment as well, trying to attract the United States uh, investment in Japan. In, in, indeed, Todd, I did. I, I had the, the benefit... It, just, just a portion of the governor's portfolio, but, but, 
but probably a similar background being a business person. But then I served as Commerce Secretary in my home state governor, or, or ambassador, I should say, and um, spent a lot of time recruiting Japanese foreign direct investment before I ever became ambassador. In fact, uh, by the time I left, I had a four-year tenure. Uh, when I started, Tennessee was in the bottom of all, you know, all economic metrics. We had high unemployment, you know, low GDP growth, low wage growth, et cetera. By the time I left, we were top in the Southeast on every one of those metrics, and in many cases, tops in the nation. One of the things I was most proud of is that when I left the last year, Tennessee had become the number one state in the nation for foreign direct investment and jobs created through foreign direct investment. And guess what? Japan was 60% of that, meaning more than all the other nations combined. And I presume probably was the only Commerce Secretary that could deliver a speech in Japanese. And I spent a lot of time focused there. When I got to Japan, uh, I continued that effort. Um, I'll, I'll share one story, Todd. Um, before I left for Japan, uh, a friend of mine reached out to me and he said, hey, I just met Takuma Sato, the Japanese driver that was the first Japanese to win the Indy 500. He said, you'll love him. You ought to meet him when you get over to Japan. Well, I did more than that. I asked my econ team when I arrived to, figuratively speaking, take that car apart to figure out who made the, the engine, the tires, the, the, the ball bearings that were in that car and invite the CEOs of every one of those companies to a celebration at, at, at my residence to celebrate Takuma Sato's victory. We did that. I reached out to Honda Motor Company. They sent the Indy car over. We had that, you know, on display in the driveway. My kids love that, by the way. And, um, you know, we had the engine on a stand and we had a great event. Takuma Sato is bilingual, so he was able to speak both in Japanese and English. Uh, he did a great job. And at the end, I went before the group and I thanked everyone that had already made an investment in America and encouraged them to do more. And for those that had not, I encouraged them to, to take a hard look. And then we followed up with a calling program to go and visit those companies. And Japan, in, in, in that, that short tenure, the, the, the time of my service, moved from number three to number one in terms of foreign direct investment dollars committed to the United States. We can move the dial as ambassadors. It's possible. And uh, that, that, I felt, was a part of my role, maybe not a part of the explicit charter for the ambassador, but something that I had some experience doing. And it really does make a difference. My argument with the Japanese is very simple. You ought to be making in our market what you sell in our market. And, you know, it takes out currency risk. It takes out supply chain risk. Uh, it, there, there are all kinds of good business reasons to do that. And definitely we move the, we move the needle, I think, uh, during my tenure there. Great. Now, we have a lot of, uh, oh, hang on, we've got some questions from the audience that I'm calling up here. Um, Question from Ambassador Cutler, who was our ambassador to Saudi Arabia. As a member of our Congress and two important Senate committees, how do you assess the role of Japan's legislature in formulating that country's foreign policies? In other words, how do, they, how do the roles of those legislatures differ in the United States and Japan? Um, their legislature is very involved in foreign policy formation, as, as is ours. Uh, and it's not just a matter of dealing with their equivalent of the White House. Uh, you know, their, their legislative leadership uh, plays a significant role. They tend to play a big role in relations with China and South Korea too. And that was something that I was mindful of as ambassador, uh, working with those leaders uh, to make certain they understood our position and how we needed to cooperate. Uh, but also they play a very di direct uh, and important role in the formation of Japanese foreign policy. Um, Likewise here, uh, the United States Senate plays an important role. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee does as well. I, I took the first CODEL, which you all remember that, a congressional delegation. I took the first CODEL trip that has been taken since the pandemic shut the Congress down. I did that last week. I didn't go back to the Indo-Pacific as most people might have expected. I went to Guatemala and Mexico. Hmm. And I did that because we've got a crisis at our border that's got to be addressed. And I met with the president of Guatemala and, and his foreign minister. I met with the foreign minister and the minister of economy in Mexico. And there was an opportunity for me not to go to the border and have a photo op, but actually use the skill set that uh, I developed uh, doing the role that we've all played, um, to use that skill set to try to sit down, understand what the problems are, and try to build a foundation to work toward a solution. Thank you. Uh, here's a question from Ambassador Chorba. Uh, Tim Chorba is the president of the Council of American Ambassadors and uh, was the ambassador to Singapore. Um, 
If the PRC were to move against the Senkaku Islands, what is the U.S. obligation or position on protecting them? I made that very clear from the moment I arrived there. Uh, that is, that would be an act against us. That would be, we, we have a security treaty. The security treaty would cover that, and we would take action to protect and, and defend Japan and halt that activity. It's, a, it's an item of great concern because uh, the, the, the PRC stepped back during the time I was ambassador, but they've begun to ramp this activity up. It started last year. And they, they harass uh, you know, fishing vessels in the Senkaku Island region. Uh, it's, it's a constant thorn in the side of the Japanese. And you know, it's, a, it's a very serious issue. The more aggressive step that was taken very recently is the PRC took steps to weaponize those ships. Their Coast Guard is now allowed to be armed their Coast Guard is equivalent to, uh, you know, their Navy. Uh, they just, they, they, it's another misnamed uh, aggressive posture that they take. But uh, this, this threat in the Senkaku region is something that we should not overlook at all. And, uh, you know, Harry Harris is, is on the call. He's dealt with this extensively as well. But uh, the Chinese military aggression in that region uh, is something not to be understated. Uh, over the past couple of decades, the Chinese have increased their military budget eightfold. The number of ships that they have has now exceeded the number of ships that we have in our Navy. Now, I don't want to confuse quantity with quality. They don't have nearly the lethal force that we have, but they're moving in a direction that is extraordinarily aggressive. It's a matter of concern. And if you think about what they've done with these coral reefs, there are about half a dozen islands now that have been created in the South China Sea, where they've gone in and crushed coral reefs, poured millions of tons of concrete into the ocean to build military assets. And if I think back to 2015, when you saw President Xi stand in the Rose Garden next to President Obama, she said that they had no intention of militarizing these islands. Well, if you haven't, Google Fiery Cross Reef. Uh, Harry Harris had a model of it when he was head of the Pacific Command. Uh, it's a full-on military asset. It's weaponized, it's got a giant runway on it, turrets. Uh, this is what they're building. And this then supports their fictitious claims to the fictitious territorial claims in the region. And this is along one of the busiest shipping lanes in the in commercial shipping seaways in the world. So it's a matter of grave concern. And uh, you, you raise a good, good question, Ambassador, one that we need to keep our eye on closely. That's the activity of the PRC in that region. Um, thank you. Actually, it's a good segue to the next question, which is from Harry Harris, uh, <laughs> who is our ambassador to South Korea. Could you comment on the Quad and whether Japan would support South Korea becoming a member? And thanks for all you're doing. Yep. Um, Harry, thank you for your service. And I, I, I just will share this with the other ambassadors. But uh, Harry came to see me when he was still head of the Pacific Command and, and thinking about becoming ambassador. Uh, he dropped in a visit with me in Tokyo. I remember, Harry, we had lunch at the, uh, at, at, over at the American Club. And I remember telling you that you're going to <laughs> you're going to take a major step down in terms of um, the, the 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 amount of protection and the, um, the the assets that you had under your control. But you did a fantastic job as our ambassador, just like you did uh, running the Pacific Command. Uh, with respect to the Quad, I've been very encouraged. Uh, President Biden's first uh, outreach to other world leaders, he he did a um, a, a virtual meeting with his counterparts in the Quad. And um, you know, there, there he had you know, the Prime Minister of, of, of India, President of uh, Australia, and, and the Prime Minister of Japan with him. Um, I don't know what the, uh, what, what the ultimate decision would be on the Quad, but I would certainly welcome uh, South Korea's participation and engagement. The more, our, the more of our allies that we can bring into the fold, the, the better. Uh, I certainly felt that way when we were building out what became known as the Blue Dot Network. But this is our um, th this is our countermeasure to China's One Belt One Road initiative. That's that's infrastructure funds. We took the old Overseas Private Investment Corp, changed the name to the Development Finance Corp, took some of it, USAID's budget, basically doubled the size of OPEC. Then we signed up. Uh, we signed a deal with Japan. We did it in you know, the living room of, of the ambassador's residence there when I was serving. Uh, Japan's balance sheet is about seven times the size of old OPEC, so that brought in a lot more capital. Then uh, before, before Ambassador Kovahouse got there, uh, we brought the Australians into the fold, and they have a smaller development unit, but again, having 
more countries involved makes it uh, a lot easier, I think, for, for the smaller countries that need our help to reach out and ask for it. They don't want to get caught between the United States and China. But as we have more, more countries involved, we have better results. And so um, I love the way you're thinking, Harry, uh, with respect to South Korea. I think we ought to look at it from a military standpoint, from an economic cooperation standpoint, uh, every chance we can to work with our allies in that region because it sends a very strong message to China. Well, thank you, Senator. <clears throat> thank you, Senator. I wonder if you could, uh, since we're on Korea, if you could talk about what role you played uh, in your uh, capacity as ambassador and also what role the United Japan could play today in uh, dealing with North Korean issue. Well, there's some aspects I can't talk about on this line uh, that we were dealing with uh, with respect to North Korea, but I was very involved in that. Um, and before Harry's arrival, we didn't have an ambassador in South Korea. Uh, so I, I, I took an early role. In fact, when I was talking with President-elect Trump, uh, I remember laying out data with him. I just had 10 months of data, but that was the, uh, from, from, from January to October, the launches and missile tests that had occurred in 2016. The ramp on that was, I mean, there, there'd been more tests occurred in those two months 10 months, I'm sorry, than it happened in the I don't know, dozen years prior. So the escalation was, was well underway. It was clear that we were going to be facing a big problem in North Korea. And the president was expecting me to be involved in that. That was the nature of our discussion when he decided to send me to Japan. Um, the, the situation with North Korea, uh, you know, really ramped up uh, shortly after, or as, as I was arriving, I guess it, it was, it was, the rhetoric was high, got even hotter. While I was there, I remember the very first day that I arrived uh, at the embassy, I pulled my team together, uh, knowing that, you know, many of them probably had voted uh, in, a, in a different way or, you know, wish that they'd been a representative of a different administration there. But I brought them all together. I told them that I'm a man of faith, as I am, that I believe that I was there for a reason. And I believe each of them were there for a reason, too and that we are facing unprecedented challenges in, in the area, not only from North Korea, but also from China. And that I needed, their, I needed them to remember why they joined the State Department, why they come to work for the US government. I needed their very best performance. And I tell you, I, I felt like I got it. Uh, some, you know, some people may have taken a little bit longer to, 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 to come on board than others, but I really feel like um, the, the team stepped up to the challenge and North Korea provided in an odd way uh, the opportunity for us to forge an even tighter bond with Japan. And Japan could not have been a better ally as we put in place three consecutively stronger sets of economic sanctions to the United Nations Security Council. They were there with us every step of the way. And, um, you know, the, 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 the effort to deal with North Korea is ongoing. Uh, I, I think the Biden administration is taking a very hard look at that. And I hope that we'll continue to, 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 to find ways to keep the situation in check there and, and hopefully make progress. It's a, it's, a tough, it's a tough problem that's been going on for, for decades, uh, dealing with the Kim family. We're in the third generation of them. Harry, you've dealt with this uh, you know, extensively, but we, we have more work to do, and I hope that we can find ways to continue to be constructive there. Thank you, Senator. Uh, a question from Ambassador Sella. Uh, to the degree you can speak about it, can you please share your reflections on your interaction with your PRC counterpart? Um, that's very simple. My interaction with the PRC counterpart was zero. I never had any interaction whatsoever. Uh, and that was intentional. That um, was the message. <laughs> that was the message that, that I was gonna have no interaction with them whatsoever. Another question from uh, Ambassador Blanchard. Um, you're, you're quite an expert and have a, a, a rich background in trade. Uh, do you, what do you think about the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership as a way of countering uh, Chinese dominance in the region? Um, I know that that was uh, articulated as a strategic reason for entry into the TPP. The situation I found myself in, uh, we withdrew from the TPP uh, within a week, I believe, of, of uh, the, the previous administration coming into office. It was an option that, that the Japanese kept pressing me on, come back into the TPP, come back into the TPP. So I went back to the president and asked him under what circumstances he'd be willing to entertain that. 
uh, he told me we needed to change some of the rules of origin uh, so that the TPP didn't become a vacuum to actually move more, particularly automotive production into Southeast Asia. He wanted to see that, that direction coming back toward America. I went back to uh, then Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga, he's now the Prime Minister, and told him that, would, that, that we would need to be having conversations in that direction uh, to, to see the, the window open to come back in. And he told me something that's not surprising. Um, there were 11 other nations beside ourselves in, in, in that agreement. Um, and, and Suga said that you need to imagine this like you would a piece of finely blown crystal. And if I begin to torque it or change it, even slightly, it's gonna shatter. I've got everybody to the threshold now and I'm not gonna be able to go back and renegotiate uh, any major terms of the agreement. And I said, this is precisely why the president doesn't like multi, multilateral agreements because of lack of flexibility. And uh, you know, that's, that, that's where we were. So then we began to proceed on a free trade agreement uh, that was a bilateral agreement. From the United States perspective, from, from an economic perspective, um, we already had trade agreements with half a dozen of the nations that were in the TPP. When you add Japan to, the, to, to, to those six nations, you get to 90% of all the trade that occurs in the region of, of, of the dozen countries. So um, on, on actual economic value standpoint, uh, the, the FTA that we put in place with Japan, and I worked my heart out for two years. These are not easy to do, as some of you know. Um, I was very involved in trying to create the circumstances for it to happen. Um, I think Ambassador Lighthizer would tell you that I was uniquely involved in the negotiation process. I think rarely does the USTR get very involved with the local mission, but uh, I, I was very involved in that process. With it. And in fact, went back even after I finished my term as ambassador, I went back for the, for the signing with uh, Prime Minister Abe and with the president and, and Lighthizer because I'd had such a, such a role there and I was so pleased to see that done. There's more we can do uh, with Japan on trade, but I had a unique experience of, of, of working sort of from, from beginning to end on a, on a bilateral FTA, and I hope that will inform my, my work here in Washington now. Thank you, Senator. We, there are growing tensions between the United States and China over Taiwan, and I wonder if you could talk about the role uh, Japan could play in uh, dealing with those uh, issues. I think Japan can play a very significant role. Uh, I was encouraged to see Prime Minister Suga. He, again, he was the first uh, for, foreign head of state that uh, President Biden uh, met with in person, just as Prime Minister Abe was the first one that former President Trump met with in person. I think that underscores the significance of the relationship and the, and, and the, the fact that that relationship for the United States is extraordinarily important in that region. Uh, Japan can play a very significant role. It does play a significant strategic role. And in, in the joint statement, and you know how painful these are to get out, but in the joint statement, I saw a, a, a forward movement, a more forward leaning position than I've ever seen from Japan in terms of talking about Taiwan and the need to, to work with us to protect Taiwan. Japan is extraordinarily concerned about what might happen there. We should all be concerned about what might happen there. And I feel like, uh, you know, anytime there's a new administration, uh, you should be expected and prepared to be tested. And China is you know, already testing us in a number of ways. Uh, we need to be strong with respect to Taiwan. We need to be clear in our messaging on that. We need to have our allies like Japan at our side to send a very clear message to China that we're not gonna tolerate um, you know, th their aggressions toward Taiwan. Thank you. Uh, another question from Ambassador Sella. Any, any reflections on the possibility of Japan becoming the sixth eye? You know, that's, uh, that's a conversation that um, I think we should, I, I've, I've opened that conversation with the Japan side. They would love to see that happen themselves. Japan's got work to do, though, in terms of how they, um, I'm trying to think of what I can say here. Um, th there are a lot of requirements to be uh, a member of the Five Eyes in terms of how intelligence is transmitted and protected. And there's a high standard there, and there's work to do. Um, to, to make certain that, that uh, Japan would operate at the same high standard that uh, we do with our, our current five eyes for them to become a sixth eye. But I think there's a real desire, a real appetite on their side to do that. And from my perspective, 
uh, given their strategic location and, and, and the, the, the dependence that we have on them in such a vital region, I would love to see them move in that direction. Thank you. Um, you know, you, we were talking about trade before, and the recently appointed Jap Japanese ambassador, Shimida, has said our economies have never been closer, and Japan is the world's largest investor in the U.S., he says. Uh, as a member of the Senate's uh, Banking and Foreign Relations Committee, I think you mentioned the banking was maybe the most significant uh, committee in, in Congress. How do, you, how do you see strengthening those trends? Well, I also uh, always remind the Japanese that America is the number one investor in Japan, too. So I, I want to see you know, continued cross-border investment that brings our economies closer together. And I do believe that our economic security and our national security are very closely linked. So to the extent we can continue to strengthen our economic ties with Japan, that's net positive uh, for all of our interest. And if you look at the commitments that uh, Japanese companies have made, I'll just take Toyota because I spent a lot of time with Akio Toyota you know, trying to get to this place, but they've already committed $13.5 billion. I think the number is going to be at $15 billion very soon. Of, of investment here in the United States. They've got to do that. I mean, I, from, from a, a business strategy standpoint, I think that it's imperative. Uh, this is the largest market for so many companies, particularly Japanese companies. Um, they should be, again, building what they sell here. And so I wanna continue to, to further that investment. Um, we've been very fortunate in my home state uh, to have that investment be so successful, uh, but I, see the benefits of that. And, you know, we've got over 50,000 Tennesseans that are directly employed by companies that are headquartered in Japan. So I think that's a, that, that's a positive relationship and, and one that we should continue to see move forward because Japan's got demographic problems of its own as well. Uh, they don't have the workforce to continue to expand domestically. And I think the United States can be a, you know, a great partner in that regard. Again, you, you know, I, I mentioned I'm very focused on getting jobs uh, you know, to America, every job that we possibly can. Yeah, yeah. But to the extent that we don't, uh, so, uh, I would certainly like to see those jobs uh, you know, in this hemisphere. And in my meetings with you know, leaders in Mexico and Guatemala, we talked about the reshoring that's happening from China. Japan is aggressively trying to get its companies to reshore from China. They're even incentivizing companies Japanese companies that don't move back to Japan, they're incentivizing their movement to other countries. Oh. And I think that the leadership in, in, in both, you know, the, the economy minister in Mexico was uh, surprised to hear that, but encouraged. Uh, certainly the president of Guatemala was encouraged. So these are areas, again, where we can work with, with our allies in this hemisphere um, as Japanese companies, you know, reposition their supply chains uh, again, the, the, the threat of China being something we're all very familiar with, but that threat is having a very real impact on companies and how they think about their supply chains. And given the disruption that we've seen over the past year plus, a lot of companies are rethinking their, their locations right now. Well, you're talking about a lot of American jobs. Indeed. Indeed. I think it can have a very positive effect. Um, the, the ambassador, Tamita, also mentioned environment and climate change and space exploration as areas of common interest mm -hmm. and cooperation. Do you have any comments on that? You know, um, I, one, one of the agencies that was represented at, uh, at, at my mission in Japan was NASA. And we have, uh, you know, an incredibly strong partnership with uh, the, the Japanese version of NASA. Uh, you know, they are, they, they are going to be great partners in, in space exploration. I'm encouraged by what we might do there. Uh, I think likewise, with respect to climate, uh, Japan has the best clean coal technology in the world. Um, you know, we can work with their development agency to help companies transition, I say companies, countries transition from the dirtiest, um, you know, the, the, the dirtiest sort of energy, you know, along the, along the pipeline to, to, um, you know, something much more sophisticated and less polluting. Uh, we need to not be theological about this and try to force them all the way, you know, force these developing countries to, you know, 100% renewables right away. Uh, we need to think about that evolution in a, in a rational manner. But Japan can be a great partner in that regard too, as, as we think about uh, lowering emission levels overall. Um, I think there's plenty of, there, there's plenty of great opportunity there for, for our two nations to cooperate. 
uh, Ambassador Louise Oliver, who was uh, an ambassador to UNESCO in Paris, uh, asks, you obviously work very closely with the U.S. military, but what about the relationship of our military with the Japanese people? Are there tensions there or not after World War II? Um, I, I'd say that the, there are tensions. Harry Harris knows this very well, too. Um, they're not, the tensions are not related to World War II as much as they are the fact that you have, you know, a, a group of young, energetic people who are out drilling every day. I'm thinking about the Marines in Okinawa. We have close to 20,000 of them there. Uh, you, you can imagine when you've got 18, 19, 20-year-olds, uh, you know, just, just charging hard every day. And when it's time for a little R&R, &R, uh, it can, you know, it can get, you know, there, there can be some challenges. And every time my phone rang on a Sunday morning at 7 a.m., I knew it was the, the commander of the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force telling me what happened in Okinawa on Saturday night. So, you know, I had to apologize for those sorts of things. Uh, on behalf of, of America, I've had some very stern phone conversations with uh, our, our military leadership about reining that type of thing in. I can remember one situation where a, a young man had been out on the town and came in. The houses are kind of similar looking in Okinawa. He went and got in bed and, you know, flopped on the bed with a... a, a very elderly Japanese man because he got the wrong house. You know, that's that's the type of thing that uh, creates tension uh, locally. Uh, also, we you know th th there were there were situations where you know a part might fall off of a helicopter or as we're doing some exercise or creating noise. All, all of these things uh, create challenges, particularly when you're in a densely populated area. And, and, and Okinawa saw that. Um, that that was probably the greatest challenge, uh, but it wasn't based on any type of long-term uh, thoughts about World War II. It was really, the, I think my challenges, uh, you know, as a senior American there, my challenges really had to do with just our presence and the fact that, you know, we're, we're bringing people, you know, in to do military exercises and drills that create noise, uh, you know, that, that, that may create some other issues in the community. Thank you, um, Senator. Do uh, you think that, uh, if Rahm Emanuel is the next ambassador to Japan, as has been rumored, do you think he should take up golf or tennis? <laughs> I think uh, golf would be a very wise thing to take up. Uh, I spent uh, plenty of time doing golf diplomacy myself uh, because every time the you know Pr Prime Minister Abe and President Trump met, we had a round of golf to to go with it. So uh, that would be advisable, uh, I, I would think. I don't know if Prime Minister Suga plays golf. Uh, I never played golf with him when he was chief cabinet secretary, but he was working around the clock at that point. But generally speaking in Japan, um, golf is a very good means of diplomacy. So I would, would encourage whomever uh, the next ambassador is, uh, I, I would encourage them that they, they would do well to, to have a good golf game. And there's good advice. Uh, here's a question from Ambassador Diana Lady, Lady Dugan. Uh, as you know, there are a number of major task force reports and recommendations to restructure and not just reform uh, the Department of State, as well as the Department of Defense in particular. From your own experience, you know well there's a great deal of duplication, mission creep, budgetary disconnect, duplication, conflict among the various uh, you know, entities based on the very diverse experiences of the Council of American Ambassadors serving in senior policy and negotiating positions based in Washington, as well as embassies abroad, overseeing major policy and negotiations. Uh, could the council uh, be helpful in, uh, in, that, in that conversation? I, I, I think that is a great suggestion. And in, in my role, I, I'm the ranking member in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for the, the sort of the operational side of the State Department. So that's on the authorizing side. And then I'm also... Uh, the appropriator. I'm also on the subcommittee that does the appropriations for uh, the State Department. As I sit on the uh, as I sit on the Senate Appropriations Committee, so I'm going to be very focused on the way we spend our tax dollars and to see those tax dollars spent as efficiently and effectively as possible. And I share the you know having lived in the system, uh, I appreciate all of the comments that, that that you made in terms of the opportunity. I'm going to use the polite word to uh, Im improve ourselves. Um, I had, I, I'll share, a, I'll, I'll share another story with, with the group here. And Todd, I think I've told you this before, but it has to do with the foreign military sales program. 
and several of you have dealt with, with, with this, I'm certain. When I arrived at uh, Mission Japan, uh, I was going through the process, I know that you all did, you know, figuring, figuring out what every portfolio was there. And uh, I quickly got to the foreign military sales program, uh, which is very large uh, between uh, our nation and Japan. Um, we had a backlog of over 700 cases. So when I asked, tell me how long it takes from the point that the government of Japan said, yes, I'd like to buy this program uh, till we actually have it on the ground installed and operational. Well, the team had to go back to work. And you know, my, my background at Boston Consulting Group, I like to see things laid out and quantified. And when we got to the bottom of it, the range was between five and a half and seven years from start to finish. The majority of that time was paperwork and bureaucracy. That's not going to surprise anybody on this call. The majority of that time was paperwork and, and bureaucracy. So I reached out to uh, a, a friend, David Petraeus, and I asked him, I said, look, I know you've had to you know, deal with challenges like this. Who can help me fix this? Who do I need to, to get behind this to actually put a dent in this program? He said, there are only two people that can do this. He said, it's either the SecDef or the president himself. So I pulled together the, the analysis uh, that I had. I made, made the appointment, flew back to Washington. And I sat right across uh, the, 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 the resolute desk from the president with H.R. McMaster, who was our national security advisor then, and General Kelly, who was the chief of staff, I went through it. And the president said, let's get this bureaucratic paperwork time down to 30 days. I said, Mr. President, I love the way you think. And H.R. sliding down the chair and you know, General Kelly's head's about to explode. Uh, but we started this, this process of, of, of figuring out how far we could move the dot. We didn't get to an answer in that meeting. But I walked out, I called Jim Mattis and I said, uh, you know, Here's what I've done. Uh, the president's behind it. Uh, and I'm looking forward to working with you. He said, Bill, this has been bothering me ever since I ran CENTCOM. He said, I'm so glad you're taking this on. And, and, and Jim and I talked about it and agreed that let's just make Japan a test case. Let's not try to take on the whole system, not at once, but let's, let's create a test case with Japan, see what we can do. But if we're able to do it, that's going to stand as an example for what the rest of the system could do. So uh, Jim working with, with, uh, an undersecretary named Ellen Lord, who is responsible for acquisitions, um, they put together a tiger team led by a general, General Hooper. And Hooper had this team just cranking and they did a monthly report to me because you need to have some forcing event, right? They did a monthly report to me on how they were progressing in terms of cutting out the paperwork. Uh, there were, there, the Department of Defense is not the only area though that plays a role here. State Department plays a role, Commerce Department and the Hill. So I met with the folks that ran the division and State Department that, 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 that touches this, made it very clear. And, and you know, we, we conveyed this very clearly through the State Department, what needed to be done. The Commerce Department, they were all in, uh, in terms of, of helping. They, they had just a very small touch to this, but they got it. They understood. I met with the people in charge there. And I reached out to Ben Cardin, who is a Democrat Senator from Maryland. I didn't want it to seem partisan in any way. And I knew, I knew Senator Cardin from my confirmation process. And he was great to pull together the, the team of people on the Hill that are responsible for signing off on this stuff too. We got everybody together, explained that Japan was a test case and everyone agreed to prioritize it. And in doing that, we're still not finished. And I'm, I'm actually waiting for my readout now, and, you know, the, the update on where we are. Uh, I think that's been scheduled maybe, maybe for next week, but we moved that timeline, we compressed it by years and we're still, we're still working on it. So it is possible to come in, I think, in a focused way, uh, a you know, demonstrate that it is possible to change and improve, to parallel process things, to, you know, to, to, to take some of this uh, friction that we all see in Washington out of the system. And in doing so, it's going to, I mean, if you think about the technology that we want to see deployed with our partners in foreign military sales, yeah. that technology would be outdated by you know, seven years from now. So it's going to make our uh, integration with our partners much stronger, more effective. Uh, there's nothing that's not good about this as long as you do it in a thoughtful manner. So that's the kind of approach I hope that uh, we're able to see more of. And I, I look forward to working with, with the Council of Ambassadors to bring their thoughts into a process like this. Great, thank you. Last question from uh, President Chorba, uh, Ambassador Chorba. Japan's previous envoy to the U.S., your counterpart, Ambassador Sugiyama, was a great friend of ours with the council. Uh, 
Do you know in what capacity he's now serving back in Japan? He's retired. He's retired. Okay. Yes. So he, was, he was a good friend of the council. Yes. Uh, and, and finally, one more question. Speaking of sports, what do you think will happen with the Olympics? Boy, um, this is something I, I, I'm still on the phone with Japan most nights. Um, the Olympics are, are going to be a real challenge. Suga's numbers are not, you know, th th this is going to be a real challenge for the prime minister. There have been billions of dollars expended by the government of Japan, uh, you know, to build the infrastructure for this. Um, you, you think about the corporate sponsorships, this sort of thing. They, they, there is a, a lot riding on this, but the people of Japan, as they poll it, are very concerned. They're, they're encountering a spike right now in terms of, of coronavirus cases. The people of Japan are very concerned about bringing, you know, so many in. And, you know, I, I think there's a real concern. Countries like India, who are, who are having, you know, just an, an incredible increase in, in, in the rate of coronavirus cases may pull out of the Olympics, may not send their folks. They're not, you know, no one's saying anything for sure right now. But everyone's thinking that the decision is going to have to be made in June. Could this go to a spectatorless event that's all televised? Perhaps I, I, I'd give that, you know, higher odds than, than, than continuing where we are right now. Uh, would it be Japanese nationals only as spectators? You know, I, I'd give that a little bit lower odds, but that's a possibility. Could they be canceled altogether? That's a that's that's also got a possibility greater than zero, but I'm not. I would not forecast that at this point. Well, Senator, thank you so much for your time, and thank you for uh, serving our country so well in Tokyo. And uh, we're very grateful for the time you spent with us, uh, considering your uh, incredibly harried, I'm sure, schedule. So, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again, and you. Uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch. Todd, thank you, and thanks to everybody for their service. Uh, I, I, I share the, the, uh, the, the, the great appreciation for having represented our country, as all of you have, and, and thank you again for, for having me today.